All right, hi, um, my name is Rachel. I am the Outreach Librarian and School Services Librarian at Lakeville District Library. Um, this is our CPD workshop for teachers called Restoring Media Literacy. I have Tim Jones, Nate Gass, and Haley Samuelson, Samuelson, who I will let them introduce each other and what they do. Um, I actually watched this at um, a library conference and thought it was really interesting for maybe like secondary teachers to learn how to teach their kids. Um, because what we learned back in library school or in education school about how to evaluate sources kind of needs some updating. Um, and then, so if you are taking this for ISBE credit, um, I emailed out the handouts before. If you didn't get it, you can um, email me back in Outlook and I will send you a link to all the slides and forms and everything. All I need is your evaluation form when you're done filling it out and then I will email you the signed ISBE credit. So any of those questions can go to my email, which is rhogan at lvdl.org. Um, but I also emailed you the link so you can just respond to that. And then if you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A um, and we will do questions at the end. Um, so I will let our presenters take it away. All right, thank you, Rachel. Uh, welcome everybody. Again, this is Restoring Media Literacy in a Post-Truth World. As Rachel already mentioned, this was a session that the three of us presented at, uh, at the annual American Library Association Conference uh, just last summer. Uh, so we're happy to do it again for you. Um, in this sort of uh, virtual environment. Let's do some quick introductions here. Um, make sure my slide, there we go. All right, since we're going, I guess we'll go left to right. Oh, left to right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I am Tim Jones um, and I am from Trinity High School in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, we are an, an all boys school, um, about 1200 enrollment. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter if you'd like there or, or not. Um, I have, I, I did this ALA session with, with Haley and Nate. And then I also did a, uh, another media literacy session with a slightly different twist uh, at American Association of School Librarians Conference in 2019, I'm thinking. COVID has thrown my, my timeline off, but I think 2019. Uh, so I've been really interested in media literacy and presenting on, on that for, for quite a while. And, and Nate and Haley were gracious enough to let me be their third wheel for this presentation. <laughs> we're happy to do it. Um, I, my name is Nate Goss. I'm a librarian at the Cook Memorial Public Library. Um, those of you who are local to uh, Lake Villa, you know, Libertyville is kind of right around the corner. So um, it's the Cook Memorial Public Library District that covers Libertyville, Vernon Hills, parts of Mundelein, uh, Green Oaks, Metawa. And um, I uh, am sort of, I, I co-teach a lot with Haley, who you will meet in just a second. Uh, we teach all sorts of uh, media literacy. Uh, sometimes we call it fake news. We'll get into a lot of that stuff in the presentation, but we've been teaching these kinds of courses to our public library patrons uh, for a very long time. And you have my uh, email there if you ever wanna reach out with questions and my Twitter as well. Uh, and I hand it over to Haley. Hi, I'm Haley Samuelson and um... Like Nate said, we both work at Cook Memorial Public Library. I'm a reference librarian there, and my email's there too. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out. And I think uh, before I move on, I think one of the things that we have brought to ALA and what we hope to bring here is you know, bringing Tim in with the school library perspective and us coming from the public library perspective, we're kind of seeing this as a, a collaborative approach of teaching media literacy in both the schools and the libraries. Uh, so here's our agenda for tonight's session. Uh, what we want to kind of talk about is kind of starting with some baseline definitions. Let's talk about what we mean when we uh, say a post-truth world. And one of the questions that we're kind of, uh, that, that's being asked and that we're trying to address is, is teaching media literacy even still a valuable thing within this post-truth climate? Uh, we're going to uh, conclude that, you know, we, we think it is. <laughs> and then uh, we'll move on and we'll start touching, talking about some of the tools that we've used in our classes to teach these things, our experience teaching in both the public library and in schools. And then we're going to close it up a little bit before we open it up for questions, just talking about uh, some ideas and brainstorming about ways that the public library and the school library uh, can collaborate with one another on these efforts and also talking about some helpful resources so you can keep up and keep fresh on all the latest in what's being taught and how to teach uh, this topic. 
So we are going to start out with some basic definitions just to make sure everybody is on the same page. Um, so the, we talk a lot about um, media literacy and information literacy and people kind of tend to use them interchangeably, but they are two different things. And our classes tend to really focus on news literacy, which is one part of media literacy. So we are really focusing on the ability to judge the reliability and credibility of news reports. And that's morphed as we've been teaching this class for a while, um, where we are looking at print, TV, and online news. But we just wanted to kind of frame that. And there's a whole media literacy guide in the library, and this is where I pulled that from, and that's hyperlinked there so if you would like to look at that that guide okay so why is this such a challenging thing to do right now in schools and libraries well it has a lot to do with uh, this sort of nebulous idea of living in a post-truth era and post-truth was actually oxford dictionary's 2016 word of the year and you can see the definition right there where it's basically this idea of um you know when whenever we're presented with objective facts, those are actually less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Basically, like what you feel is true is more important than anything that could be looked at as objective truth. Um, and this is often referred to as sort of an era that we're living in or a context, and it's where what correlates with reality or what can be proven or disproven is not really as important as what sounds or feels right. Um, or you kind of get the sense that truth itself is not even attainable, that, you know, we, we can't actually figure out what the truth is, or we kind of walk around with a, well, who can know kind of attitude about things. And this feeling can permeate everything from, you know, content that's presented to us as news to statements or quotes by powerful people to the kinds of articles and memes that get thrown around in Facebook arguments, the stuff we're all familiar with. And a serious problem with this muddying of truth or the constant impression that the truth is unknowable. The problem with that is that this is often a tactic exploited by authoritarian governments or simply those that are looking to take advantage, misinform or scam people. You know, which is why it's really important that this pursuit of truth is protected, even if truth itself can sometimes feel really hard to define, especially when you're trying to teach this in a library or school situation. But what we as librarians and educators can do is establish tools for sorting out good and bad information and help students focus on information they can justifiably believe is at least interested in telling the truth and that the author's or publisher's motives are transparent enough to calculate whether that information is actually worth their time to dig into. We can also help students grow into savvy web users that can really take any topic and apply a few tools and a little practice and can quickly give students a sense of what the general landscape of information is on any topic. You know, since none, none of us are philosophers and we're not really teaching a philosophy class, the most we can do is kind of demonstrate that these tools, uh, is to demonstrate these tools and guidelines so that students can gain some sense of direction within a post-truth era. That's really kind of our primary goal is to try to give some people a sense of grounding in, in, in this environment that we're living in. Uh, one thing I want to mention before we move on um, is that this slideshow we can send out to you and our notes have all sorts of links to articles and research that we've all kind of uh, linked to. So if you want to dig even deeper into this idea of post-truth, um, there's a link we'll have in the, the comments area of the slideshow that you can dig a little bit more into that, along with a lot of other slides. Um. So some more definitions you hear misinformation and disinformation and misinformation seems to be more of the go-to phrasing than disinformation i think that's wrong <laughs> because misinformation we're all guilty of you know that is misinformation is you know when you're giving somebody directions and you go to the end of the block and take a right oh oops after the person leaves you realize oh i meant to say left Ooh, my bad Disinformation is deliberately misleading information. And I think there's a lot of purveyors of disinformation out there. And that's what we're seeing on social media and in Facebook, that type of thing. Um, and I think that people who fall for disinformation and then continue to repeat it are then kind of 
going into the land of misinformation, if that makes sense, because I think the people who hear the disinformation, they're not the ones who are deliberately trying to mislead um, the people they're sharing that with. They just don't realize that that's not reliable information. So the people who are starting the bad information are doing disinformation and then it turns into misinformation. So that was really confusing, but those are two separate things that we just kind of wanted to point that out to, to you all. You're not going to change anyone's mind on social media anyway. I don't know how many of you have heard something similar to that. I've heard it probably 72 times. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a lot. I hear that a lot. And so I started to think about what does that even mean? Uh, and is, is that true? Because it sounds really truthy, right? It sounds like truth. Uh, you can't change anybody's mind on social media. And so if you can't change anybody's mind on social media, why even try? If the disinformation is out there and causing people to think, the wrong thing then why even try to get better at media literacy and news literacy um but but how true is it so we looked into that uh people actually do change their minds um here's a chart from uh, pew research center uh showing that since 2018 uh people have changed their minds on such such subjects as black lives matter political parties uh, ideologies different political figures uh, because of something that, something that they saw online uh, through social media. Um, it's not 100%. I mean, we would, be, we would be going crazy if we changed our mind like 100% all the time. That's not uh, sustainable, but like it's a pretty healthy amount of people who, who do change. Uh, somewhere in the 23%, uh, so all social media users have changed their mind uh, over the course of a year on some topic. Uh, and that's and that's admitted change like there's probably changes that uh, we've probably changed our minds about other things and just maybe aren't even aware or we, we don't admit it so people actually do change their minds so it's I would just uh, advise you not to give up it's it's fight the good fight it's it's worth fighting so um, So uh, the strength of weak ties, so what is that? Uh, weak ties, basically it's a, a sociological theory. It's been around since 1973. Basically it states that, we, uh, that weak ties are like a bridge between groups of people um, as they're close in it with each other, uh, but not with other groups. So librarians serve uh, as sort of a weak tie. Uh, we're kind of bridges between different information um, circles. Um, maybe we're, we're not super close to um, our uh, patrons, but we are a weak tie that can help strengthen uh, good practices and good information. Um, school librarians, public librarians, uh, we can be a weak tie between uh, users and their family and friends and all those in the circle. So uh, I also want to talk a little bit about what the social brain is. Um, UCLA neurologist Matthew Lieberman uh, was studying the brain and he found that uh, our brain actually tries to prevent us from accepting ideas that might isolate us. Um, we, um, and it's called the social brain or like that's, that's the uh, Lieberman's term for it. According to Lieberman, uh, social thinking is so important that evolution gave us a separate brain system just for this type of thinking. Um, this network switches us from being information consumers to information DJs. And the reason I share that this, this is because I find this to be very humbling. Sometimes it's really easy to get uh, up on my soapbox and be like, why are you believing this? Uh, and be like mad at people. But uh, once you realize that like our brains are just kind of wired to kind of go with like what doesn't uh, ostracize us, it's a lot easier to kind of, I think, step back and go, whoa, let's, let's pause um, and cut people some slack a little bit and realize that like our brains are just kind of wired to uh, be deceived by our social circles. Uh, so um, a little bit more. Um, so the more that people think, uh, the, so the more that people think that people like them, believe or act in a certain way, the more likely they are to believe and, and do the same thing. 
Uh, social media only exacerbates this. It is designed to exploit how neurologically wired for acceptance we are. Uh, that can be bad when our community of trust is awash in so much disinformation. We're susceptible, wired even to value the opinions of our community of trust, even over that of knowledgeable experts. More than anything, this knowledge should cause us librarians, I think, to reflect on how we incorporate socialization in our programming. You know, consider bring a friend initiatives, make your program feel conversational, and which I think Nate and Haley do a great job in their presentations. I've seen their presentations. They do a great job with making their um, lessons very conversational. So I'm gonna leave this on the screen for a few seconds. What are you thinking of? You're thinking of an elephant, right? It says, don't think of an elephant, but that's what, you know, if you try to think of like the, the, the opposite of the negative, you end up thinking of, the, of that thing. So um, that's how our minds work. And that's how fake, fake news and fake information and misinformation, disinformation get a hold on us. And you'll go to the next slide. Um, so our brains are wired to just kind of remember and accept the information here is first and most often, uh, even if it's false, uh, even if it's not true. Uh, so uh, that's what studies ha have found. Uh, and when the information is, is repeated, regardless of whether the information is true, we, we, we tend to, to believe it. Our filter bubbles will repeat that information and often break news for us regardless of whether it's, it's true. When you combine this reality uh, with the social brain, like just the socialization component, uh, the result uh, is catastrophic like we have seen it the last few years. Um, to restore media literacy, I think we need to encourage social media users to communicate the correct information as early and as often and as kindly as possible. That can sometimes be a challenge. It's important that users see accurate information before they see false. Because again, it, the, if false leads, that's what people are gonna remember. So the earlier you can get the correct information out there, uh, the better um, and reduce the false information. We can also model the truth sandwich uh, for them. Uh, this can help counteract the flood of disinformation. The truth sandwich is basically, you first you state the fact, the, you, so you're starting with the truth, and then if you must mention the lie, uh, that comes second. You don't lead with a lie and then debunk it. You start with the fact, then you debunk why it's not true without repeating it. Uh, and then you restate the fact. And that is um, uh, worked on our brains to help us to not um, believe false information. Uh, school libraries and public libraries uh, who reach different ages of users can complement each other's efforts every time we teach or model media literacy. Uh, Stephen Hassan, he's a mental health counselor who is, um, he came up with the hashtag I got, I got out. He specializes in disinformation cults. Um, he is popular, like I said, he's popularized the I got out uh, hashtag to destigmatize de leaving a, a disinformation cult. His advice for helping people get out of disinformation cults can be broken down into three tips, as you see on the screen there. Uh, we can use these tips as librarians. First, ask gentle guiding questions. How would a counselor ask their patient questions, for example? You know, just be gentle, calmly, patiently withholding judgment. Uh, second, don't connect the dots for them. That, that can be very, very uh, tempting to do. Uh, we can lead them to the dots. We can ask questions. But if we allow them the freedom to make those connections, uh, that will ultimately be more fruitful. Again, you can show them the dots, maybe in a chronology that might gently help them see a connection. But like if you don't make the connection for them, they, they, it's kind of like their own little scavenger hunt. And they can be like, oh, I found truth. And so that, that's a lot more um, empowering for them. And then third, uh, just avoid shaming. It's hard to admit that you've been duped or that you're wrong. So people will just kind of stay in their disinformation cult where they have social support. In our interactions with users, we need to model the growth mindset 
and uh, try to no normalize admitting wrong. Uh, I constantly making um, mistakes. Um, we, we all do. So if we can admit like we make mistakes and how we personally try to grow from it, uh, I think that makes a huge difference. So in our library programming, uh, let's talk about what works effectively. Uh, library programming can take on endless forms. Uh, the key principles that will help our media literacy programs and our day-to-day -day interactions are these. Um, social is everything, uh, normalizing humility, uh, rewarding progress, avoiding shaming. So I'm just kind of summarizing some of these points that I've talked about. Uh, framing reinforces information. Uh, story building, uh, which you'll see a little bit later between uh, uh, Nate and Haley, uh, it helps build trust. Uh, play helps us learn. Uh, visuals help us remember. Uh, research has shown how effective storytelling, play, and visuals can be. Children learn a lot about the world through play, but adults can too. Um, I learn a lot through play. Play can look like role plays. It can look like games or gamification, drawing. Uh, a lot of things fall under the umbrella and it, play improves our, our critical thinking. So there is not a one size fits all approach to teaching this type of literacy. So we're gonna talk about what we've done first in the public library and then Tim will go over what he's done in a school setting. And this is just stuff that's worked for us. Um, So we started teaching classes quickly after the 2016 presidential election when the term fake news was everywhere and meant a lot of different things. So um, our classes has, have morphed as the information landscape has continued to morph. So right now we're doing navigating online information, tips and tricks for a post-truth era. We, has, we love that phrase, post-truth era. And, um, we are trying to help people navigate information that are primarily encountering online, but we touch on other forms of media as well. And we have kept some basics through every class. Um, things like what kind of information are you engaging? Things like news versus opinion and um, gauging your emotional response um, to a news article because dis disinformation often evokes strong, a strong emotional reaction. So kind of teaching people to be in tune with what's going on um, not only outside, but, but what's going on inside of them as they in, engage with this news. So we've tried to break our class into four tips. Um, and we are hoping that maybe they remember one or two when they leave our class. But we've really tried to keep them basic and hopefully easy to apply. Um, we'll talk about SIFT more in a minute. But that is one thing that really attracted us to this method is it's quick and it's easy to apply and a lot of the other models just seem very um, cumbersome. So, you know, it's, we're learning to sift, we're trying to understand bias, not only within reporting, but in, within ourselves. We're encouraging people to diversify their information landscape, so read, watch, and listen widely. And then we're also giving people permission to take care of themselves and to say you don't have to be an expert and up on every single news story and every single topic, but you can pick and choose. And you can also just say, I'm going on a news hiatus for a while because it's too overwhelming. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, Haley said that our class has evolved and morphed a lot, and that's very true. And it's also been true because the more that we, uh, the three of us, have done our own looking into best approaches for media literacy, a lot of the ways that librarians have traditionally taught media literacy um, has sort of, uh, it, it's it's become less and less effective um, to address issues that are very specific to the time that we are living in. So I don't know how many of you educators or librarians are familiar with the idea of CRAP. Um, this was an acronym that was very popular, but there are other acronyms. And the, all of these acronyms are, were basically ideas on what you do if a piece of information is put before you, how you decide if it's good information or bad information. And CRAP stood for, you would look at it very deeply and say, 
uh, look at it for currency, relevancy, authority, accuracy, and purpose. If you could remember all that stuff, and if you could really scrutinize that article, you could decide if this was a good piece of information or a bad piece of information. And whether it was CRAP or a different acronym, they were all sort of the same approaches to critical thinking. The idea being, what you need to do is take the information in front of you and really burrow into it and analyze every piece of it to figure out if it fits the criteria that we've given you, this huge checklist of good information and bad information. But we decided in our classes, and because of mostly information overload and the way that so much information is out there and available to everybody, and there are so many authors of information out there, this is just not sustainable. So we had to come up with uh, different ways. And luckily there are other researchers who had the same ideas and came up with new approaches. So the way that we've been rethinking critical thinking is uh, brought about because the web has changed. Uh, we live in a time of information overload. Over half, 53% of Americans get their news sometimes or often from social media. This number is actually highest among the young who are more likely to get their news from social media over news sites and Google searches. Um, and you know, uh, what happens is often people will scrutinize sources and this can have in a, in a landscape of so much disinformation out there, this can actually have adverse effects. As Stanford's done a lot of research on this, and the research that they did showed that today's students are really unprepared to judge the credibility of online information. In one of their studies, they took two websites. One was the American Academy of Pediatrics, you know, sort of the go-to professional source for pediatrics. The, American, the other one was the American College of Pediatrics, uh, which was, uh, some consider it sort of a hate site because it was a agenda-driven group that really had their main focus as trying to stop same-sex couples from adopting children. But the websites looked very good and they took that same those websites and they had historians, professional historians at Stanford and students at Stanford uh, look at that website, both websites, and have them say within five minutes which was the good website, which was the bad website. And this was the research that showed they did terribly. And they also used up all their five minutes to figure out and then still got to the wrong conclusion. Whereas fact checkers within a matter of seconds were able to look at both sites and say, this is the good one, this is the bad one, okay? So it had a lot to do with what we're gonna get into in a second, but this is just the idea that, um, this whole idea of scrutinizing your sources can actually have adverse effects. And so we don't wanna teach people to do that. And you know, you probably see this yourself when if you're on Facebook or on YouTube, this whole idea of doing your own research, that mantra that you hear, like don't accept that, don't accept everything you hear, do your own research, especially when it came to like vaccines and things like that. This has resulted in a lot of widespread belief in conspiracy theories and false information because frankly, most people are not prepared to do their own research. They're not prepared and don't have the tools to know how to do the research, to know what of what they're taking in is good and which one is just complete false conspiracy theory out there. And the other reason we need to rethink this is again, with information overload, if you take something like crap or any of the other huge long checklists that are out there, those are very time intensive and just not very realistic. So what do we do? This is what uh, Haley and I had been switching actually over to teaching, which is a, uh, it is another acronym. Librarians and educators love our acronyms. We couldn't quite escape that totally. But this one is called SIFT. And it was developed by Mike Caulfield, who's um, director of uh, Blended, um, hold on, I can't see what I, sorry, I blocked my own notes here. Blended and Network Learning from Washington State University in Vancouver. Um, now we're gonna get into it in, in a little bit, we'll talk about why we like this so much, but it's a four step process. These do not have to even happen in this order and you might not even get through all the steps. But the idea here is the first thing you're gonna do when you see a news uh, article or when you see a post on social media, you're gonna stop and you're gonna try to figure out, can you even figure out what the source is and are you familiar with it? If you're not familiar with it, you're gonna investigate the source. And what we, what, we're, what we do, what we mean by that is that does not mean that you burrow into the source. It means you actually go outside the source and you look at what other people are saying about the source, or even if you can find information about that source. And that brings you to F, which is find, which is even if you can find information about the source, when it comes to the actual story you're looking at, you're gonna actually try to find better or other sources and see if they are covering the same topic or the same issue. And then lastly, um, Trace is when you're looking at an article, you're gonna look at and find out 
what any claims that are there, any quotes, you're gonna always try to go back to the original context of those. So if say uh, an article is saying as reported by, and then there's a link to the original report, you're gonna encourage people to go to that original report and get the original story instead of the way it's been processed and synthesized you know, by whatever blog or YouTube video you're looking at. These are just very quick, uh, it's, we're calling it a toolkit basically. This is a toolkit that we can give students um, to, to, to do this. And what I wanna do now, um, hopefully I can do this quickly, is I'm gonna switch over to show you an actual video clip of uh, Haley and myself teaching this through role play, through play as Tim was talking about, where we actually, um, we don't even tell them what SIF stands for yet at this point in the class. We just demonstrate, this is what it looks like in action. So if you can bear with me for just one sec, let me see if I can bring it up here. And apologies for our wonderful acting skills. Yes, yes. in advance, yeah. <laughs> um, hold on. Sorry, one sec here. I'm gonna stop the share real quick. Who's there? We'll do this one, I guess. Tell me if you can hear this, hopefully you can. SIFT is and understand exactly what we mean when we talk about it. Uh, but before we go into the heavy details of that idea, uh, uh, Haley, I ran across this post today on my Facebook feed uh, by somebody who looks you know, suspiciously a lot like me and has my name, but I was just, this, this, this post really gave me pause. I mean, we're talking about the vaccine right now and this, this really seems scary to me. I, I don't know what to do with it. And it made me made me pause and think, what do you think of that? Well, I, I see some good things in there. Immunologist, you know, so when you're talking about vaccines, an immunologist is somebody that you would turn to and you would generally trust. Um, you know, health defense, children's health defense.org dot org usually is something that's pretty trustworthy, not always, but you know, that's a good that's a good sign. What, where I would start is I would actually try to figure out who the heck is Children's De um, Health Defense? Like, what is that? I don't know. I have no idea what that is. I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe we should, we could look into it. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and just Google Children's Health Defense Fund and see what that's all about. Okay. If you go to their Wikipedia, if you go to Wikipedia, they might have um, just a like oh, here a, it is. a better down and dirty than what how they're going to describe themselves. Okay, so right here is the Wikipedia for Children's Health Defense. Here's the first line. Actually, it says it's an American activist group, mainly known for anti-vaccine activities. That that sounds interesting. Well, you know, for me personally, that sounds like they have more of an agenda than they're trying to provide you um, news. It seems like to me that they might have a dog in this fight. So I would maybe try to take look at their claims and find a better source. But, you know, that's up to you what you feel comfortable doing. You know, I don't know. I mean, I definitely recognize there's an agenda, but, you know, they are a registered 501c3 nonprofit. So they are okay. a legit group. And, right. um, you know, it was an immunologist that was. Uh, yeah, know. do they say who the immunologist was that they're citing? That's a good question. So maybe that's what we should do next. Why don't we, you know, I, I'm i going to go ahead and click on this and take a look at it. Real okay. Quick. Okay, so it looks like the immunologist that they're referencing is veteran immunologist J. Bart Classen. Have you ever heard of him before? I have not heard of J. Bart Classen. So again, I would Go back out to Google, see if he has a Wikipedia page or anything else that comes up. All right, let me just go ahead and him. type his name in and see what's going on. Yeah. Okay, he's got a Wikipedia page. Ooh, but he also has a PolitiFact about him. And PolitiFact is a fact checking organization. So I would maybe start there and see what they're fact checking him about. All right, let's take a look. All right, so he's got one rating and it's a pants on fire. Oh, okay. okay. Um, let's see. Oh, and it's for that, it's for the actual article we were looking at. Oh, all right. All right, so I'm just kind of skimming this here and it looks like, 
the research article is baseless. Okay. And it does look like PolitiFact even reached out to Klassen for a comment, but it said he, that he only said his paper speaks for itself. So I don't know, this sounds like an immunologist that isn't really interested in engaging with other immunologists or with the field and doesn't seem to want to even defend his own paper too much. You know what? I think I'm with you, Haley. I, I think I've kind of seen enough here. I don't really think I even need to read any more about this article or, or know anything about it. I feel pretty good just kind of ignoring this and not wasting my time with it. Okay, yeah. And All right. Um, oh, let me get back up here. Let me get back into my uh, other slideshow here. Oh, sorry, one sec. There we go. Are we good now? Are we back on the screen? Okay. Okay, so there you saw basically just a role play that we did. Again, apologies for the bad acting there, but that was us demonstrating SIFT before uh, we even talked about SIFT as a way of showing this is what it looks like in real life. So why did we shift to SIFT? That's a lot of ifs. Um, but we felt like it was more honest about how we encounter information and better at addressing information overload. So we didn't even, if you noticed in that role play, we did not even actually read the article. We read it enough to see who the immunologist was, but we went to who was publishing the article or pushing the article out and who the immunologist was. We didn't, we didn't read anything in the article. So um, it was a, you know, that is more honest in terms of Nate ran into it in a, on his Facebook page, even if he posted it, but <laughs> and it helped us to quickly address that information overload of saying, oh, I don't even need to read this. And it took, you know, if we were doing that in real life, it probably would have taken one minute in our role play. It took what, two. Right. Uh, the other thing is that SIFT really is just introducing the concept of lateral reading. Lateral reading is actually not new. Um, it's been around even before the internet. It's just this idea of to find out more about something you're reading, you go outside the source. You leave it and you find out what other people are saying about it. So you might have even heard the term lateral reading somewhere else. SIFT is just basically breaking down the idea of lateral reading for how to uh, sort of uh, apply those tools to an online environment. There's less of an emphasis on evaluating the source, which can play into the hand of authors of disinformation because people got really wise of looking, they looked at crap as well, that checklist and said, okay, this is what people are looking for. They're looking for a .org, they're looking for a logo, they're looking for when it was been updated, they're looking for an about us section. And they designed these disinformation workhouses <laughs> um, to fall, to, to hit that checklist. So this gives you less, infer, um, less emphasis on and less power to the actual source, but more of what are people saying about that source. SIFT also gives us, allows us to place more emphasis on just, decide, just deciding if a source is worth your time. Um, so, you know, the idea, even especially of like tracing, where you're just trying to find the original source, you might come across an article. It's not a bad article. It might not even be disinformation or misinformation. It might just not be the best one that's worth your time. And so one of, so one of the byproducts of SIFT is you're also te teaching people how to what Michael Caulfield calls trading up. So like, Basically, you're looking at a source and saying, yeah, you know, um, really quickly, if they're already referencing another source, uh, let's just find the one that's worth our time and let's get rid of the ones that aren't worth our time. And finally, it's not a rigid checklist. You could just do S. You can just say, I'm not familiar with this. Uh, I'm going to stop right there. This is evoking a lot of really strong information. I'm going to stop right here. You could just do T where you see a meme go by that really gets your heart rate up. And then you're like, well, let me trace this quote. And then you realize it's four words from a paragraph <laughs> and it's four words that painted the narrative or de defined the narrative that that person, that disinformation purveyor wanted you to get. So, you know, you can just kind of pick and choose what letter you would like to do from that. So. Nate and I also want just wanted to kind of give you some of the takeaways that we have had from teaching media literacy. As librarians and teachers, we do have the expertise to do this, so trust yourself. Examples, 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 and more examples because people need to see what, need to be able to engage with what we're talking about. Personal anecdotes can establish humility, so we're talking about times that we fell for something that we didn't 
you know, we just bought it hook, line, and sinker and said, oh, oops. <laughs> um, politics is unavoidable and you need to teach it anyways. Um, we know how to be neutral in our profession and so you can trust yourself. And a lot of times people are coming to this classes, these classes, especially in the last probably six years or so, because they're trying to figure out what politicians are talking about and whether they should believe it or not. So you can do this and you can remain neutral. You often will be preaching to the choir and that's okay. You know, the people who are showing up at these classes are concerned and they're trying to figure out how to wrestle with this, whether for themselves or how to um, deal with um, family members, whatever. Um, but it's okay. It's okay that you're preaching to the converted. Um, modeling that librarians are information experts. Um, so you're putting yourself out there and saying, this is how we evaluate information in our daily lives, in, the, in our daily work lives. So people can come back to you and say, oh, okay, we know we can trust them. SIFT or any acronym is just a starting point. You can build on it um, and you don't have to be married to it, but you can start there and then make it your own and then keep trying new things. Our class has mo has morphed and morphed and morphed and there's been some stuff that has worked really well and there's some stuff that fall has fallen flat and you don't know until you start experimenting. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Tim. And he's gonna talk about what he's done in a school setting. All right, so, um... I'm here to talk about like the, what the growth mindset is versus the fixed mindset. I think a lot of us educators are familiar with those terms, but uh, the growth mindset, uh, if you're not familiar, is just like it's trying to focus on like how we can get better. And I think if we can focus on growth mindset versus fixed mindset and letting students know that uh, it's okay to change your, your mind, that, that's good. And so I incorporate that into uh, my Nearpod lesson, which I'm going to talk about in just a little bit. Um, before I address the whole school approach. I think a whole school approach, uh, embedding media literacy uh, and news literacy in classes in small doses is also extremely effective. Um, but I'm gonna start by talking about um, my Nearpod lesson that is a, a one-off media literacy lesson. Um, it, Nearpod is an online software that can make a lesson uh, or any, any lesson or presentation interactive. Uh, I really like Nearpod. Uh, it can be used in person, uh, hybrid, or via distance learning. Uh, the presenter controls the pace, so learners move forward together uh, and assesses learning in real time through instant polls, through feedback, and activities that reinforce the social element I was talking about earlier. That's why I'm really, really getting into why I like Nearpod, because I was talking about the, um, the social brain earlier. This, uh, I think Nearpod and the social brain really inter interact or together. Uh, in my Nearpod lesson, I began to, by introducing the growth mindset and letting the anonymous poll results show students how popular uh, challenging your bias, biases actually are in principle. And most, most students who took that poll uh, said that they uh, believed in truth and that they thought it was the most, the most important thing was to, was to get better. So I kind of trapped them into agreeing to the, the correct uh, philosophy before moving on. So uh, one activity I do in my Nearpod, which I sort of stole from Nathan Haley's, um, is asking my students to create fake news. Uh, they created, uh, Nathan Haley created a fake WordPress page a few years ago uh, in a session that I saw of theirs uh, with their public library users. Uh, but I use breakyourownnews.com uh, and you might be familiar with that or if you're not, it, you, you should be. Um, I asked my students to come up with some school appropriate clickbait headline um, and sub headline that would quickly go viral related to their community. Uh, I used and clickbait like if I asked my high schoolers what that term is like most of them know what clickbait is they've uh, already heard and they know what that clickbait is and they get annoyed by, by clickbait. Um, so that really resonates with them. Um, so after uh, we come up with some school appropriate clickbait headline and subheadline um, that would quickly go viral, uh, we find an image and then, and then we're done. Uh, then I ask them what consequence this information might have. So uh, one example I gave was I, I put a picture of, of my high school up there uh, for the students. And then I just asked the students like, what headline would cause a, a photo of our high school, just a really innocuous photo of our high school to go viral. Um, and so, they gave um, op 
thing like uh, suggestions like you know a school shooting or maybe uh, a teacher was arrested or something like that like obviously that would go viral really quick whether it's true or not um they came with like lots of really other more creative ideas than that um and so it's it's it, it taps into their idea of fun and play um and also socialization the idea is for students to experience firsthand how easily disinformation creators can spread content and for students to connect the dots to what those dangers might be. And so there, I give them a poll question, what real world consequence might our fake news story have? And so then they, they kind of share on, on the board there and that's really helpful for them. Uh, a couple other uh, online games uh, that I encourage you to take a look at are Bad News and Go Viral. Uh, they are both created by the University of Cambridge uh, they are designed to help increase users' ability to, ability to identify and, dis, and dismiss misinformation and disinformation. Uh, these are fun. Uh, they're really humorous games, and I would recommend them to especially high school students uh, through adults. Uh, the object of the games is to spread misinformation and gain followers, uh, which teaches players critical thinking and how not to be tricked by misinformation in real life. Uh, so you can link these games to like your school library website or your, your teacher page, um, or if you're uh, in the public library, uh, your public library site. Uh, I will have my students play these games uh, and they go over very well. They, they, there's a lot of laughter that has had. Uh, they like getting followers. Uh, they see how quickly, how quick it is to, uh, to get followers based on false information. Uh, it goes over pretty well. Um, so if you and if you want to get parents involved, uh, school librarians could even ask students to play these games with their parents if you feel comfortable enough to do that. Um, for uh, younger kids, Be Internet Awesome or AKA Interland is a digital literacy game developed by Google that I would also recommend for uh, middle school on down. Uh, and these are a couple other slides from my uh, one off Nearpod lesson. Um, I also make the case in that lesson uh, for authoritative sources and expertise uh, because a lot of what we see out there is just uh, no one believes in credible sources anymore. So I feel like it's important to kind of speak to uh, why certain sources are authoritative to begin with, why we can have confidence in them. Uh, journalism is increasingly under attack around the world. Uh, and not just in an existential sort of way. Uh, according to a study uh, this last year, 20% of surveyed US TV newsrooms said their journalists had been attacked last year. 20% one out of five. In larger markets, that number was nearly double. Uh, a lot of people don't understand what journalists do uh, or what ethical standards they are held to compared to what you might find down a YouTube rabbit hole. Uh, this lack of understanding makes it very easy to cast uh, the media as enemies. But we also see this misunderstanding and distrust of authoritative sources in science. Uh, quote, do your own research, end quote, has become the mantra of rabbit hole aficionados everywhere. So as a school librarian, I try to help educate students on what makes sources credible or authoritative. Uh, I want them to see why you can trust them. Uh, but I also want to humanize them and demystify the people behind these professions because to a lot of students, to a lot of adults, they're just it, this amorphous blob thing that um, you can't trust. Uh, they don't know that there's people behind it or they don't really think about the, the people aspect of it. Uh, I think the earlier, more often that this education can take place, the more it can ripple among uh, tomorrow citizens. So. Um, that means like having, uh, maybe inviting uh, a journalist to your class um, to talk might help to humanize. Um, so, by, so by the time that public librarians like Nate and Haley work with them, it's not as daunting. Uh, media literacy requires a whole school approach. If you can get buy-in, uh, that might take a little bit of work. I would encourage you to work with um, those you can work with more easily first, like friends and um, who really, really would buy into what you're selling. Uh, the most seamless places for buy-in are with social studies, uh, English and science courses, I think, who already touch on a lot of media literacy concepts. 
I know the teachers uh, at my school already touch on a number of those things, especially in social studies, English, and science. Uh, but we can help them uh, really maximize that uh, by giving them more tips. Um, and some of them may not even realize that they tap into it, but uh, kind of reaching out to them uh, might help them do an even, even better job. Uh, Inquiry-based learning, critical thinking, uh, logical fallacies, cause effect, the scientific method. Uh, a lot of classes, uh, their students are already learning this content and these skills. Librarians just need to encourage teachers to make connections between these skills and the media uh, that their students consume as well. Um, however, many, many teachers don't incorporate media literacy um, for two reasons. One, they, they, do, they don't have professional development in how to teach it, um, so they just don't know. Um, and I think you can work with them a lot, a lot easier. Um, and then there's the other, which is the mindset that they're not responsible for teaching it. Like that's, some, that's somebody else's job. Uh, media literacy doesn't come naturally to a lot of educators. Um, we, we have to, as librarians and educator, educators in schools, um, help teachers to see that like it, it, it takes a village. We all have to, if we can integrate uh, media literacy, uh, information literacy, uh, news literacy into our classrooms and our lessons, um, it's, it's worth doing. And here are a few ideas for library program programming. Um, you could do theme programming like a news literacy week, uh, science literacy week, a math literacy week that kind of help um, students be able to sift through information and critically think about them. Um, you can bring guest visitors um, to ask like, what does a journalist do? What does a scientist do? You could have like a human library, have lots of different people from different backgrounds um, that can help humanize um, some of these uh, authoritative sources. Uh, there's lots of great opportunities for collaboration between teachers, school librarians, public librarians, uh, journalists, and more. And now Nate and Haley are going to talk a little bit about collaborating in the public libraries. Um, just, just a reminder, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box down at the bottom and we will take those all at the end. Um, a little disclaimer, when we did this for the American Library Association, um, we were focusing on the public library aspect and I realize we're with educators today, um, but I think that these things can go both ways. So don't get scared off just because it says, what can public libraries do? I think it's what schools and public libraries can do together, but make basic connections, introduce yourselves, make sure you know who the school librarian is and who the public librarian is, take advantage of opportunities offered by the schools or the public libraries to make yourself known, um, promote summer reading in the schools, um, and in the schools promote summer reading so kids will get involved in the public library over. You know, think about can you, can the public and school librarians attend a training together, um, like News Literacy Project Camp, which is a great, um, great resource, and we have a slide at the end, or I just came in, um, got invited to something called um, that's Library Journal and School Library Journal are doing together and actually happened in October, but it was Resilient Together Building School and Public Library Partnerships. So th maybe that's something that the school and public librarians can get together, get a group discount and um, make some basic connections that way. Um, there's passive collaboration, tagging adult media literacy classes as a teen program um, when you're teaching them in the public library, displays in the teen and children's spaces, encouraging media literacy, social media posts geared toward school age patrons and you tag the schools. Um, our library gets tagged all the time by the school librarians and teachers, so that can go both ways and demonstrate good media literacy habits during reference interactions. So we're walking um, our process, we're walking through our process with our younger patrons. And then finally, um, some active collaboration, which is just, you know, partnership with school librarians, getting together, getting creative, guest appearances in the school library or classes, and then joint promotion of something like a media literacy week or month with activities and prizes at both libraries. I was talking to my son's high school librarian and, you know, she had this great idea of some of the programming that they do in the school library. She's like, oh, I'd love to be able to have the high schoolers come to the public library 
and teach adults what they've learned in school. And she was actually specifically talking about elections, which like perked my ears up because they do research on candidates and like parlaying that research for adults at the public library. So, I mean, just get creative and kind of like the sky's the limit on dreaming. Um, and then finally, and these are list, those are not groundbreaking ideas. Those are pretty down and dirty. Um, these we just have some online resources here and i think we can kind of just leave that slide up as we do some q a here oh there's a few other uh yeah the, the, the last, last two, uh slides uh, here are just resources but to have time for q a i think we just send the slideshow out and it's basically people to follow on twitter some books to check out and uh um some great online resources as well That was awesome. Thanks so much. Um, we do have a couple librarians on here, school librarians, so I think they got a little bit too. Um, we did have we did have one question, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, one of the attendees was researching more into the person you were talking about on your skit, and they're like, they said, "Is does this person actually exist?" Because they were looking, and it and they're not listed anywhere as an immun immunologist. So they were wondering if you found the answer. I mean, as far as I know, I think they do exist. Well, I mean, I didn't really go that far into it because I think what we did was, uh, you know, PolitiFact said they did reach out to them and and they they did get a response from the guy who just said it's the paper speaks for itself. So the thing is, I have no clue how respectable this immunologist is in the profession at all. But, you know, that that's kind of part of SIFT. Like that would be a pretty quick and easy thing to figure out. And my feeling is if you're not hearing any, if it's very hard to figure out anything about this expert, then how much is their expertise really? Because people who in any, and this is true for any field, if they're involved, if, they, if they're participatory in the field, it's a social thing. And you're going to find um, you know, other people, like they're willing to engage with other people in the field and you should be able to find some things that are published and what other people have said about that person. Yeah, you could probably check LinkedIn to see if right. you're listed anywhere. And then the library has a lot of databases where you could keyword them as an author and see if they have any journal articles published. Because I know like if they're in the scientific field, they're expected to have articles published in journals and those get peer reviewed also. I did, um, I did find him on Wikipedia, um, <laughs> John Bartholo, Bartholo, Clausen, um, and they have all of his, where his degrees were from, and he was also fact-checked by Reuters, um, and Reuters did reach out to him, so unless they're, yeah, it does seem like this is a real person. I'll, I'll also just say some kind of inside baseball for how we developed, like how we chose that to be the one that we would, you know, demonstrate was we actually just to, you know, because uh, we know disinformation is everywhere, but then when you actually have to pick one out to demonstrate for the class, you're kind of like, uh, you know, so we just went to Snopes and found one that was debunked. And I was like, this is a good one that we could use as an example, you know, so just for educators out there, if you need to, if you need to find examples, go to the fact checking sites, find the stuff that's been debunked and then pretend like you didn't know that and you know, do a demonstration of how you would find that out. You know. Yeah, that's a good way to work backwards. Yeah. Um, someone also said like talking about how Wikipedia is not reliable. We actually did this in um, grad school where we made a fake Wikipedia document and saw how long it took for each person to get corrected. Mm. And actually Wikipedia is pretty accurate because there are a lot of reviewers that spend a ton of time going on there. But as always, what I tell students when I was teaching was use Wikipedia as a jumping off point if they're going to use it and make sure that you're fact checking that. So it's actually more work for the students to use Wikipedia because then they have to go into the bibliography and check those sites as well. So they're welcome to look at it to kind of help them outline and think about other, um, you know, points of argument or whatnot. But then they're always going to end up having to do that extra work of going further into it. So I would say as long as you allow them to look at it with that caveat Wikipedia could be okay but I know there are also a lot of teachers that say they can't use it at all yeah you know, you know sorry go ahead Haley. And, and for our purposes of SIFT um what you're trying to decide is should you even be reading this article um and Wikipedia is a great place to start where it's like it 
the first line was like, this is an anti-vaccine. And then we could, we could jump off to children's defense or, um, fun, but, or health defense or whatever it's called. But we didn't want to know what children's health defense was saying about itself. We wanted to know what other people were saying about, about them. And so that's why we would go to Wikipedia if we were doing something academic, <laughs> but this was just fact checking for our own personal use, a Facebook article posted by Nate's uncle. So I think there's a time and a place for Wikipedia. It's been interesting to see the evolution of how librarians even view Wikipedia, because when I was in library school, this was like 10 years ago almost, it was kind of like Wikipedia was like the evil, like this is ruining authoritative sources, you know, and um, but it's really kind of changed. I think a lot of librarians rely more on Wikipedia than they would ever want to admit. But the point is that it's not, it's kind of like the fact checking sites too. You, you take it for what it is as a starting point, but then even Wikipedia is referenced. So like you were saying, Rachel, like, you know, even if you thought something in Wikipedia didn't seem quite right, they should have a footnote next to it and you can click and get the original source they were pulling even for Wikipedia within. But Wikipedia is just such an easy place to start. It's just such an easy place to get a very quick pulse on the general consensus of any, um, you know, uh, so many publications out. Yeah, and I mean, and no one says you you need to use it, so there's that. But I'm I'm gonna wrap up since we're at five thirty one. I see people are like, ah, oh, kind of dropping off. Um, so once again, if you need um, the evaluation form and you weren't able to receive it in the email, my emails are hogan at lvdl.org. So that's R-H-O-G-A-N, or you can just respond to the Zoom invite link. That's my email. Um, I will send you the evaluation form if you did not get it, and then I can send you the ISBE credit form back. Um, I want to thank our awesome presenters. We could talk about this all night. And if you want to nerd out, feel free to email any of us. Um, and as the public librarian that does school services, um, if you wanted to, you know, collaborate on any lessons or projects, um, just give me a call. Thanks, everyone, for coming thank on tonight. You guys. Thank you. Bye.